Now, I, I, I think shoulders are very, very hard to understand, and I think that I'm not saying that you can't understand them now, but I think until about 20 years ago, I think nobody really knew what they were talking about at all. And the problem is for, for all of us who were at medical school at that time, we were taught by a style of teaching which was very didactic, and this was this and that was that, particularly from rheumatology. But they were completely wrong because nobody knew what they were talking about at all because there was no imaging, there was no arthroscopic surgery. And I think an awful lot of us got put off dealing with certain parts of the body, particularly the shoulder, because the patients weren't managed well. Well, they came to the clinics and were miserable. The operations that were done were done looking back at it with good intent, but for all the wrong reasons. And so I, I, for me, um, sitting in clinics, um, we used to sit at Stanmore and have all these terribly miserable people coming in with their arms like this and had all big scars and so on, and, and nobody got better. The feet patients are still like that now, but the shoulder patients have got better. <laughs> So um, the shoulder, I think, has become better understandable. And I think, I think you can do things with a little bit more kind of thought as to what it is that's actually causing the trouble. The other thing is that we now have a machine called an MRI scanner that was not invented. And the MRI scanner, it's almost fair to say, you can tell from the scan what's going to be wrong and how the patient's going to be presenting with the pain. So if you ask me if I wanted to have a history, an examination, or an investigation, for all patients, and if I wanted to give up one of those three, I'd actually give up the examination now. I'd just ask the patient the history and I'd want the test, because a lot of the shoulder signs or uh, described tests are actually of very, very little value. I don't know whether you are all aware of that. Um, there's a very famous man called O'Brien who has a test named after him called O'Brien's test. Do any of you know what O'Brien's test is? See, nobody know. sorry? Any, do, any, no, no. Yeah, I mean, it's to do with putting the thumb up and down. Now, O'Brien actually gave a talk at the British Elbow and Shoulder Society. He said, he said, it's brilliant. They've named this test after me. He said, it's completely useless. He says, it tells you there's something wrong with the shoulder, but you already know that because you're in a shoulder clinic. So he doesn't use it at all. And so a lot of these named tests have been based upon history and th people thinking, well, if they put the arm here, it's probably pulling on the biceps, it's probably doing this. And what I just want to show is some pictures that come from MRI scanners to show you what an MRI scan looks like and where the pain from the thing that's showing on the MRI scan tends to go. So to do it backwards, if you see what I mean. Because so many people are told they've got bicipital tendonitis, which in my own personal practice I don't believe exists as a diagnosis. I think it's part of impingement essentially, but it can also be a chromioclavicular pain because the chromioclavicular pain goes down here. And so what the body tells the brain, the brain of course is, a, is inventing a world around us which it updates all the time from what you see and it's extremely bad in, in, in knowing what's going on because you've never had any symptoms from inside your body to learn where it is. So I'm just going to run through on, on that basis. And what I want you to do is, is if there are things you'd, you'd like me to talk about, my view of it may be slightly offbeat, but I'm trying to work out in my sort of career what it is we're dealing with, and I don't think any of us really know. So if you want to stop me and just talk at any point or ask, then I'll, I'll stop. So I just thought I'd show some pictures. The, this is what, the, these are simple slices from an MRI scan. I don't know whether any of you, do any of you at all ever look at the images from an MRI scan? Looking at the shoulder, they're going to mostly be this way round. So it's as if you were standing facing like this, your face is here, and you're looking at the front of the shoulder like that, and putting a slice through it. So here, you've got the humeral head, there's the glenoid, there's the acromion. The patient's face would be looking at you up there, and they'd be facing you. Does that make sense? Now, obviously, on these slices, normally you can roll backwards and forwards through it like a loaf of bread, but I've just picked out the slices which are sort of nice to look at to make it very simple. So here, these two pictures are the same person. You can look at this little diagram here, which shows you where the line is through the shoulder in, in looking, as it were, from above. And, the, and I just want to show you... Hang on, wrong way. I'm going to keep doing that. So these pictures, this is, this is showing the acromion, which is the bone over the top of the shoulder here. The collarbone's coming in from the front, so if we go a little bit further forwards, you can just see there's the end of the collarbone coming in to make what's called the acromioclavicular joint. Now this scan, on these settings here, you can set the scanner to, to do what's called fat suppression, so that the scanner keeps bashing the fat atoms down and they stay dark, so they, everything on a scan goes dark, and anything white is water, which means inflammation. 
So on these scans, you can see a lot of whiteness around here, which is inflammation. And this is what is seen on a scan and is called bursitis, which is the superior surface of the top of the rotator cuff. And that is what, what bursitis looks like. And this is why the MRI pictures are so important, because they do actually show you, very simply, where the pain is coming from. It doesn't show you where the pain is perceived to be by the brain, but it shows you where the inflammation is. And it's happening in this person because that black thing is the underneath of the acromion, and the black bit is the, what's called the coracoacromial ligament, which comes up from the coracoid up to here. And this person has a very prominent coracoacromial ligament and is therefore rubbing that on the cuff. Um, do you all know where the pain from that would be felt by the brain of that person? Yeah, I mean, it goes down the limb, and it can go all the way down the limb to the thumb. This is the thing that's actually very confusing. So people can get what you think is cervical spondylosis pain, and it's got nothing to do with their neck at all. It can all be coming down from the shoulder. And I think it's because your brain is feeling signals coming up from here, and it thinks it must be the arm, because the only thing that it knows that's over here is the arm. And this has never hurt. There's been never any signal going to your brain for the brain to process. So this is, first of all, this is the mildest sort of looking scan that somebody like me will look at with somebody who's got symptoms. And this is what you might call bursitis, which is pain going down the arm. And fairly clearly, it hurts if you move the rotator cuff. So if you put the arm at the horizontal and move it, it hurts. And that's what near described and other people describe. And you can do it with the arm like this, you can do it with the arm like this. But if you move the arm around at the horizontal and the pain's down the arm, then it's probably going to look something like that on the scan. And that's the bit that's going to be hurting. Is that, is that, so that's, that's that bit. The other bit that can hurt around the shoulder is that bit. Now, this is rather different. So you can see that the shoulder is nice and dark. There's a tiny bit of whiteness, but can you see the brightness in this here? This is inside the bone. This is what's called bone marrow edema. And no tests, ultrasound or x-rays or anything else will show you that. And since we've had MRI scans for the knee and all sorts of other things, then people have been able to see this. Do you know where that pain would, generally speaking, be felt by somebody? AC joint pain? Side of the face, the ear, all over the upper body. It can go in many different places, but generally speaking, up towards the neck um, and when they lie on that side. And it hurts when you put your arm up at the top, across your body and behind, which is when you're twisting your AC joint. So an awful lot of people I see uh, have an awful lot of what I think is AC joint pain. And if you do an MRI scan, an awful lot of them seem to have this sort of bone marrow edema appearance here, which I personally think has been very much overlooked. Um, and there are a lot of people who have been labelled with neck pain for years and years and years and years. And if they have an operation done for impingement and they happen to have the end of the collarbone trimmed off at the same time, about a quarter of the people wake up with a neck that moves in a way that they haven't been moving for years. So that can be a very potent source, I think, of pain that runs to the neck. And the only thing that shows it is the MRI scan. And trimming out the acromioclavicular joint can be part of doing a surgical procedure to relieve impingement and bursitis pain. I'm not by any means saying that any of these people need surgery, but if they come to need it, then you can find that a lot of people with that sort of appearance on a scan, their pain in their neck goes away as well as their shoulder. And I think this is completely underreported, uh, probably not recognized at all really very much in the literature at the moment. Are you, have you had any experience of people with neck pain that you might think. And I do also wonder whether some people with whiplash injuries, of course the seat belts going over the AC joint area, actually aren't reporting AC joint pain, but that's a little thing to think about maybe in the future. So acromioclavicular joint pain is very common. Um, can I ask if any of you recognize groups of people, what age group of person might get AC joint pain in isolation? Any volunteers for, would it be, giving you, sorry? Well, rugby players, but par excellence, people who do too much exercise in the gym. So there's a whole group of people who, sh who spend their lives doing this sort of thing and this sort of thing. And this goes by the name of weightlifter's shoulder. And there is a condition called distal clavicular osteolysis, where this, the, uh, the bone at the end of the clavicle not only gets like this, but actually disintegrates and, and comes to pieces. And so there is a thing known as weightlifter's shoulder, or sometimes I think cyclist's shoulder. Uh, where you actually just dissolve away the end of your clavicle, probably due to a sort of ongoing minor trauma all the time. So I think it's very unrecognised. Uh, but an awful lot of people in their 60s get acromioclavicular joint pain, probably in, in, in excess of those that get impingement pain, actually, I think. The AC joint is a very potent source of pain. 
in the people I see in my practice, and I have a I perhaps have a group of people who come to see me that are different from the ones that come to see you. But, so that, that, that sort of pain, I think, is very much under-recognized. And the reason the MRI scan is so useful is because you can actually see that. And the other thing is you can actually show people that as well. And you see, for quite a lot of 30-year-olds, if they can see that and they say, well, that's hurting, I understand, you can say to them, well, go off and do as much weights as you like, and it might go away in a year and a half, which solves the problem. So one, one test. One bit of advice, you know, that, that can be all you need to do. So I find an MRI scan very helpful. That's not shown at all on an X-ray or an ultrasound scan. There's no, you know, and people completely overlook it. And I think there's quite a huge group of people out there with AC joint pain. So that's that. Now this is um, the AC joint doing the other thing it can do. Look, instead of getting a prominent acromion, you can see that enormous great lump that's formed on the underneath of the acromioclavicular joint, and how the rotator cuff is is having to do that great sweep through underneath there. So this is the second place of impingement. You get impingement at your coracoacromial ligament at the corner of your acromion over there, but you can also get uh, impingement through your very knobbly acromioclavicular joint here. And can you see that the rotator cuff tendon is coming through here? and it's starting to pull away from the bone here. That's a, that's, an, that's a little tear at the insertion of the rotator cuff. The muscle should be gray, and the tendon on an MRI scan, because it's got no water in it, should be black. So that black tendon should come all the way down there, and that little white bit is the beginnings of a tear. And that's what people are talking about when you get these reports that say it's torn. Now, I don't think the word tear should probably be used in MRI scan reports, because patients seem to get frightened and worried about it. I think if you said it was a bit frayed or a bit ragged, it would, it would create a gut, because they seem to think something terrible has happened, you know, that was one day it was all right, and the next day it's torn. It isn't like that. It's just like your trousers as they get older. The rotator cuff tends to thin and fray, and it's almost identical to looking at the front of the knee of a pair of trousers when you operate, and you tidy it up much in the same way as you might. And we don't have patches for the rotator cuff that work very well at the moment. That's the other problem. So, that, so that's, that's impingement at the cromiac feet. And these, these little white dotty things, does anybody know what those are around the AC joint? Those, those are cysts. White, white on a scan is fluid. So these are, those are what are called acromioclavicular joint cysts. And again, you can get an awful lot of pain from here, which can radiate up the neck. And this person would also have a lot of pain radiating down their arm when they rotated and elevated. And this sort of age group, this sort of appearance tends to happen in sort of 60-year-olds. So they're the ones that are often told they've got a frozen shoulder because they come in and they can't move it. They haven't got a frozen shoulder. They've got impingement from AC joint degenerate change with cuff fraying and a bit of stiffness as a result of that. And a frozen shoulder is something different, which I'm just going to, there are some pictures of a frozen shoulder coming up in a minute. This is what is reported as a rotator cuff tear. This, you can see here is the, the gray stuff in real life is the red muscle of the rotator cuff. This happens to be the bit at the top called the supraspinatus. There's the end of your collarbone, there's the acromion, there's the coracoacromial ligament. And here you can see the rotator cuff, the tendon's nice and black, but then it's pale, and then there's a gap which is full of fluid. So this is what happens, the tendon starts to pull off the bone. It's much the same as tennis elbow, which is where the tendon pulls off the bone with tennis elbow. Um, and this, will, this, this can be very irritable and give rise to pain and pain lifting up and rotating. It often, it can happen very asymptomatically. There are lots of people walking around with very little symptoms from scans that look like that. You'd be surprised. So that isn't necessarily the source of the pain, which is sort of where this talk sort of really meant to be going. So you can have a scan with a big abnormality, but no pain. Um, that's a tear that's getting bigger. I think that's probably fairly clear to see the rotator cuff here is starting to sort of buckle up a bit so this here should have been sticking down over here um, and oddly what happens is as these little as these tears progress from this this can be very sore to this they can get completely better so there's a whole age a whole group of people usually between about 65 and 75 who get an awfully sore shoulder and then a few months later on they've got completely better I don't know whether you see that happening and what happens is the rotator cuff seems to hurt while it's pulling off the bone. But when it's pulled off the bone and sort of retracted back, it can hurt not at all. So oddly, there's a group of people you can do an MRI scan who are elderly. And if they haven't got a huge amount of impingement, that's not a huge... They, they, they often stretch their cuff and stop hurting. And all you need to do is say, look, by you know, nine months' time, it'll have gone away again. And they don't need to do anything about it. And the hole in the rotator cuff doesn't matter, it's not a source of pain. You often have people who can do everything with full power and you don't know they've got a rotator cuff tear. There's no functional... 
you, uh, you, there are people walking into the clinics who've got no rotator cuff on the top of their shoulder and half of the back of it, who have full movement and absolutely no pain. And if you test them carefully, they might have a bit of weakness, but that's about it. And so the rotator cuff hole, which everybody used to think was the problem, isn't necessarily what bothers your patient. And this is what I'm sort of trying to sort of talk around. It's the process of tearing that hurts. Once it's torn, it often gets completely better, which seems rather bizarre. And the other thing is that, um, therefore, if that's going to happen, should you try and repair it or not repair it? And there's a whole debate about whether um, you, know, you need to work with nature or against nature, what you can reasonably expect to do, which I don't really want to sort of enter in here. But it's why you'll find that for certain patients with, with, with shoulder troubles, you know, there are many different ways to go, if you like. And very few people will behave themselves at all and wear a sling properly and so on. So I've been pushed very much towards decompressing their shoulders, dealing with their AC joint pain, leaving their cuff tear and tidying it up, and then see what happens. And nearly everybody gets completely better. In other words, they come in with no symptoms and they can often play tennis and all the rest of it, although they've got no muscle across the top of their shoulder. So it seems very difficult to justify putting them through an operation that involves six weeks with a pillow under the shoulder and all the rest of it, if it doesn't get you anywhere. This is different. Um, this is um, the shoulder joint wearing out. This is the humeral head here. This is the socket. And you can see the socket looks all peculiar. And there's no cartilage in the gap between the, the bones. So if you actually look, this, this pale stuff here is actually the rotator cuff all ballooned out by a lot of fluid in the shoulder. So this is a different thing. This is shoulder joint pain. And shoulder joint pain is usually felt in the armpit. Uh, so if you get people with shoulder arthritis, it's usually pain down here. So if you get people with pain down here, it makes you think that it might be the ball and socket joint rather than the AC joint or impingement. But you can get, of course, glenohumeral arthritis and AC joint arthritis and impingement and rotator cuff tearing and capsulitis all on top of each other all at the same time. Oh, and some neck pain that sends its pain to the shoulder. Uh, so, you know, it's not set, but this is a, a fairly straightforward person who, if they're in trouble, you could take away the, the worn out ball and put a metal one on and reasonably expect to calm their shoulder down. So that's, I'm, I'm not going to go on much longer now, I'm going to whiz through the last few. This is, this is someone who's worn out even more, look, the humeral head has become completely flattened off. And all these, you see these things here? They look like small um, uh, broccoli sproutlets or cauliflower sproutlets. And these are what are called loose bodies. And this lady had about six of them, the largest of which was almost the size of a golf ball. And so she, we didn't treat her glenohumeral arthritis. We just washed out the shoulder. We did, smoothed off the, the acromion and the AC joint, which is much more knobbly than is shown on here. Took the loose bits out. And she's now got no pain at all. But she's still got her glenohumeral arthritis. And glenohumeral arthritis isn't often very painful, actually, despite what I've just said. Um, now, this is, sorry, it's flipped the other way around. I forgot to flip it around the other way. Um, this is going to ignore that bit up here. This is all that you see if you have frozen shoulder in many patients. A frozen shoulder is completely different. A frozen shoulder is where the capsule, this is looking slightly forward. Can you see that all around the capsule, at the front of the shoulder, down the long head of bicep sheath, round here is white. The whole lining, the whole synovium lining the shoulder joint decides to shrivel up and tighten up. And it happens, you can only diagnose a frozen shoulder classically in somebody who is the following. Within five years of their 50th birthday, either before or after, who has the progressive onset of restricted movement over a period of months with the pain that comes on as the movement goes. It then stays painful at night for a few months, stops hurting at night, and then over a period of about nine months, all the movement comes back and then they're back to normal. Now that and only that, in strict surgical terms, is a frozen shoulder, nothing else. So a 70-year-old or a 30-year-old can't have a frozen shoulder, but almost by definition. Diabetic people can get frozen shoulders younger at the age of 40, but that's the only exception. So frozen shoulder is nothing to do with the end of the collarbone. It's nothing to do with impingement. It's nothing to do with the rotator cuff. It's the lining of the shoulder. And when you look inside, the whole thing is bright red like a raspberry, where it should be pink and cool like the inside of your cheek. And it's all fronded and heaped up like sort of red seaweed. And, and no one knows what it is. It happens to people who are within five years of their 50th birthday. Most are ladies, so it may have some sort of midlife hormonal aspect to it. If the men get it, they tend to be thin. Quite a few of them seem to be intolerant of anti-inflammatories, which I don't understand. I think there's something in their tissue type that makes them and to and not tolerate anti-inflammatories and develop frozen shoulders. I don't think it's the anti-inflammatories don't treat. Um, and men have it worse than girls if they get it generally. They're harder to get better. And I could talk to you about frozen shoulder if you want. Um, 
but that's, that's what it looks like. So you get this around the MRI scan. You see, if you go back to the beginning, you get really no whiteness around here at all. So although you've got that, that's the bursitis. But you see, tiny hint of fluid is allowed. But if you go to a frozen shoulder, hang on, then you get all this whiteness. Oh, both my, there are, that's all round here. Now, the last thing is that neck pain can go all over the place. And uh, there are loads of people with pain all over the body here, scapula, which is cervical generated pain. And you have to be very careful about it. Um, this is a small disc, but this is no disc at all. This whiteness here is bone marrow edema in the neck, and you can get severe pain around here. It's nothing to do with nerves being compressed. It's your brain feeling pain in your neck, and your brain doesn't know where your neck is, so it will put it all the way around here. And I know this very well, because for three weeks I couldn't move or brush my teeth. Uh, and then I developed some, some numbness here with sensitivity on either side in my C5 distribution. So it's very, very painful. And if you have residual pain around here, after you've treated your shoulder, it's going to be coming from your neck in nearly everybody. So that hurts a lot. And there's nothing, you can't replace that or get rid of it. And you have to be honest about it. And having an MRI scan helps you say, I'm very, they don't say very sorry, you're saying, great news. You've got a source of pain, it's in your neck, and it's not dangerous at all. And you have to make the most of it and grit your teeth and put up with it, which I think is honestly the case. And then people can go away, know that they've got a reason for their pain and not ruin their life. You can all talk about neck-related symptoms for a long time. It's very hard to, to put people at rest with neck-related symptoms. So all those things can hurt. Um, and that's what I wanted to just run through and see where it went. So um, thank you. Mm -hmm.